So, if you don't already know me, I'm Marcus. I'm a 17-year-old high school student who is graduating this year from an international school in Lisbon. So today I'm going to tell you a bit about the IB Diploma and basically everything that is vital for you to know before starting the IB Diploma and maybe some tips and tricks that will help you really survive it along the way. So this is for you whether you are just finishing your GCSEs and you're going to start next year or even if you're younger than that and you're just looking to get a head start on the horrors of the IB before, before you actually start them. So yeah, let's get into it. So what I'm going to talk to you about today are basically separated into four main topics. So first I'm going to talk to you about the basics of the IB and basically what it is. Then I'm going to talk to you about the outer ring of the IB. You'll get to that in a moment, which is basically just about all of the subjects and what they are in the different groups um, within the IB. Then I'm going to talk to you about the inner core, which is basically CAS, TOK, and the extended essay. Um, don't worry if you've never heard of these terms before, I will explain it all to you. And then finally I'm going to talk to you about the inner, tiny little inner circle, which is called the IB Learner Profile. So, the basics of the IB is that it's graded from 0 to 45 points. Um, and this is taking into account the, the seven different point values that go into the total. How this works is that you have six subjects and then the core. The six subjects are each worth seven points each, and then the core is worth three points, which adds up to a total of 45 points. So the passing grade for the IB is 24 points, meaning that if you get around four for each subject, then you'll be able to pass the IB, no problem. So that, that, that's great news. This being said, only 77.8% of students last year actually passed the IB, which can seem like a worrying statistic. But this is taking into account that many people around the world do the IB, and many of them are doing this on top of their own national um, system. And so they don't have the time or the dedication that, um, that, that you might have. And if you are one of these people who does do it on top of the national system, it's not to worry. As long as you really keep on top of your work, you should be totally fine. And passing the IB shouldn't be a problem at all. So the IB is divided into three main sections, as you can see on the graph here. So this is sort of shown by the different rings. Um, so let's start with the outside ring, which is the six subjects. So for the outside ring, you have to choose six subjects, um, which are three at higher level and three at standard level. Um, so standard level is, is the ground floor for what each subject is. And it's typically said to be around 150 hours, whereas higher level sort of takes it a step further and this is said to be around 240 hours of work, I think. Um, although this can really vary from school to school, and it's just what the IB sets out as guidelines, it doesn't really mean that that's what you're going to do. You could spend loads of hours on one higher level and not that really, not that many on another one. So it really just depends on your school. Um, so each one is graded from one to seven, with four being the passing grade, sort of like the C, in GCSEs or A-levels or whatever else. So most subjects have two components. One of the components is the coursework and the other one is the exams. So the coursework typically makes up around 20% of the grade and is marked internally by your own teachers and then is sent off externally, well some of them are sent off externally, um, to be moderated. What this is is basically just IAs and stuff like uh, for the sciences you have to do an investigation, for I don't know, history, you have to do something else, I have no idea. But this coursework can get more complicated and can be a bit weird with the arts and the languages. So it's 20% for most subjects, but not all of them. So don't take what I say as baseline. Um, and then you have the exams, which are typically around 80% and they're just marked by an external examiner. And yeah, that's, that's basically it. So there are six main subject groups in the IB. And what these are is just the IB's way of making sure that you basically cover all of your bases and make you a more well-rounded student and more globally accomplished and all of that. Sure. So the first one is the language A, which is basically your main language and you just pick your main language and you study it. I did English literature and it was just basically language A. The next one is your language acquisition, where you have to pick a language which you're not fluent in and basically try to learn it. Although you should be familiar with language if you're gonna do language B. If you pick a language which you have no idea about it, like 
I go and pick Arabic or something, then I would do a language ab initio, which is sort of much easier and much more from the ground up. Um, I didn't do Arabic, by the way. I did Spanish, and since I'm Portuguese, it's quite similar. And so I did language B, and it, it turned out fine. So the group three is individuals and societies, I think. Don't quote me on this. Um, it's basically just a group of subjects, which is like economics, business, politics. And, and yeah, I, I did economics personally. I loved it, so... Yeah. So then you have group four, which is the sciences, basically chemistry, biology, physics, um, and whatever other fake sciences that you can find out there. Then you have the maths, where in my time I had three levels of maths, which was math studies, standard, and higher. However, that's not the case anymore, and the syllabus for maths has completely changed. Um, so I don't really know anything about it, so I am not the place to come if you need some sort of tips with the math syllabus because I have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, and then finally you have the group six or the arts um, or the elective. I prefer to think of it as a sort of joker where you can basically pick whatever you want. I did biology because I was already doing chemistry and I needed both chemistry and biology for my medicine application um, since basically all medicine schools in the UK require both chemistry and biology. So yeah, I used my arts to choose bi biology. So passing the IB isn't just dependent on having 24 points in total. You also need to have no ones out of seven in any subject. You can't have a single two in any of your higher level subjects. And you can't have more than three threes in or below in all of the subjects. What that means is you should aim for having fours or higher in all your subjects. And then for your higher level subjects, you have to have a total of 12 points at least. And again, what that means is you should be aiming for four or above, which is passing or above in all of your subjects. And if you manage to do that, then passing the IB should be absolutely no problem to you at all. So moving on to the core, to the more inner part of the circle of the IB ring, let's call it. Um, it's made up of three components, which are TOK, which is Theory of Knowledge, Extended Essay, or EE, and CAS, which stands for Creativity, Action, and Service. So only TOK and EE are graded, and only those actually count for your total scores. They count for three out of the 45 points, which doesn't seem like much, but sometimes it really does matter with your university applications, and it does make a difference, so yeah. In TOK, you have two exams. exams. You have a presentation, which counts for 33% of your grade, and an essay, which counts for 66% of your grade. So they are each graded on a scale of 1 to 10, and a gig total is given out of 30. How this works is the essay score is multiplied by 2, and this is added to the base presentation score. What this does is it gives you a grade out of 30, and then they can use that to make the grade boundaries and give you a grade from A to E in the TOK. So in my opinion, TOK is a sort of distilled version of philosophy, where you basically just focus on knowledge. I mean, it's in the name, theory of knowledge. Well, whoa, mind blown. Um, but no, it's it doesn't really focus on the sort of philosophers behind it, so you don't really talk about all of the famous philosophers like Descartes and Kant and all of those famous names. All you do is really just discuss ideas and the different aspects of TOK. I will be going into TOK in much more depth in a later video, um, which you can check out hopefully soon. But but yeah, TOK is sort of like philosophy, but slightly different. I'll talk about that later. The main aim of TOK for the IB is that you as a person learn how to become a critical thinker and think for yourself rather than just being a mindless exam robot, um, which does make sense. And I'll be honest, it has helped me think more about things and be more skeptical. Um, however, the exams and the presentation of the, and the essay of the TOK are sort of counterproductive in that sense, where they're really formulaic and basically you just put ideas into a basic structure and it just gives you an end result. Um, sort of like you just put in numbers into a calculator and it gives you an end result. It sort of feels like that. Um, that is good news because it does mean that they are quite easy to pass. But, on the other hand, it doesn't really achieve the whole goal of being a critical thinker and stuff. This being said, I still think that it is important for TOK for you to sort of open your mind out to all of these things. And the main best way to do that is to really participate in classes 
and really listen to other people and really take part in class discussions. Because that's all the essay and presentation is, it's basically just a big discussion, but structured. Um, and if you participate in these discussions, then you're going to have so many more ideas in the future and it's going to make making these these things, this coursework, so much easier. And honestly, if you just take part and give in your ideas, even if you think they're trash, just throw out your ideas in TOK classes or in classes where you're talking about TOK stuff, then I think it can be really, really beneficial. So the extended essay is a 4,000 word paper on basically anything you want. It's graded on a scale of 1 to 36, as I'm showing here. And it's based on a various number of different components, where I will go over these in a later video where I'll explain in depth how to really maximize your marks in the different components and in the extended essay. This being said, the extended essay is a dreaded part of the IB by many students. Um, basically because many of them just end up not liking doing it. And since it takes up so much of your time, if you're doing something which you just don't like, then one, it's gonna take more time to do it, and two, it's just not gonna be very good. So I think the main thing with the extended essay is pick something that you really, really enjoy, or at least something that you're sort of passionate about and you actually care about. Because if you just pick something out of the blue, then you're really not gonna care about the extended essay and it's gonna be very tough to actually get it finished. You may be telling me, well, <laughs> yeah, but it's much harder than just saying, oh yeah, pick something that you really like. How the hell am I supposed to know that? Well, I would say start thinking about the extended essay long before you actually start to do the extended essay. Because if you start thinking about the area of study, so if you think, oh, I really want to do my extended essay in, in history, and then you sort of think about the different periods and where you actually want to do your extended essays, you want to do it on the 1930s, where you really want to focus on Germany in the 1930s. So you really hone in on what you want to do beforehand, sort of, in the first year of the IB and that can really help you sort of get organized and so that you don't really get to the second year of the IB in September or October and think well I don't have an idea yet I don't have a research question I really need to get get going because that would be a complete disaster and you do not want that happening. So moving on to CAS. CAS stands for creativity, action and service and CAS is sort of made up of a couple of components so the first is the um, CAS projects, which is basically just a project um, that you do where you basically find some friends or a group of people and you just work on something that is associated to either creativity action or service. And typically it has to be something new, which you undertake sort of a new skill or task. What I did, which I really enjoyed doing, was I created a film podcast with a few friends I think there was six of us in total, and what we did was we just discussed films. And we talked about films that we had watched recently, normally with each other, or films in the past, and basically just um, made a podcast with each other. We didn't publish it or anything, but it was really, really enjoyable. And something that maybe you guys could take inspiration from. But yeah, I would give the advice um, that with the cast project, many people just ended up doing some sort of service thing, which they didn't enjoy at all. Um, although service is something that's, is, that's good because you're giving back to the community and all of that, but ultimately it has to be something you enjoy because it is something that you should be spending quite a few hours on. So I would really pick something that you just enjoy. Mm -hmm. And then for the main component of casts is that you have to do three experiences for each of the components of creativity, action, and service, where this sort of gets done passively with your normal life. If you have a few hobbies, then it sort of just does itself. Because, I mean, no one is just sitting at home studying all day. I mean, you, you, you might be, and that's okay, I guess, but CAS is just sort of about getting out there and doing some stuff, like, um, for service and creativity. One year, we decorated a Christmas canteen for all of the homeless people in the area. Um, I play tennis, so playing tennis was obviously one of my, my experiences. And... Yeah, what, what it is is just making sure that you're more of a well-rounded person rather than someone who just sits at home and studies. And I think that the IB does do a great job at that compared to a system such as like the A-levels. Um, and then there's the dreaded cast reflections. And honestly, these aren't that bad. I suck at them. But if you put aside 15 minutes of your week, 15 minutes in a week, just to write up a few cast reflections and you just get them done every week, um, sort of detailing what you've done that week or whatever, 
um, then it should be done like this and you can finish CAS in the first year of VIB with no problem at all. So, so yeah, that would be my advice. Just set aside a few minutes every week to just write them up and just get it done. Because if you just don't get it done, then you'll have to wait for your teachers to approve it and all of that stuff and it's a big hassle. So, so finally, there's the IB Learner Profile, which are all of these words and descriptions which I'm showing you right now. And these are basically just a bunch of keywords that the IB uses to benchmark your progress um, throughout the course. A lot of people say that these are basically just a bunch of bull****. And I would agree to this to a certain extent, because yes, it can seem like they're a bunch of BS, because they're just a few keywords which don't really have any meaning them in them. However, they can be very, very, very useful. Because, hear me out. The IB is obsessed with reflections and doing reflections on your TOK, extended essay, and even reflections within your own IAs. Like for my chemistry IA, I had to reflect on what I had done in my experiment. It was just a big hassle. But if you use these keywords and you really show that you are being a risk taker or an acquirer somehow, then the IB will pick up on this and they'll say, ah, this person has used this keyword, so let's give them some points. Because that's all it is, it's just basically benchmarks to show what you have done and what you haven't done. And yes, they sort of don't have much meaning to them, but if you really include them in your work, then they can really benefit you um, and give you sort of good points with the IB. Um, so yeah, this is the first video of a long series I'm probably going to be making about the IB. And if you have any questions, just leave it down below. Um, if this video was at all valuable to you, I guess, Thumbs up, I don't know. I don't know how this YouTube thing works and and yeah, I'll, I'll see you next time.